Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. I hope you'll turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And uh, follow with me in the outline, if you would, as we try to um, explain and kind of lay out the argument that uh, is somewhat continuing. The background is the prideful, Greek, wisdom-centered attitude of the Corinthian church. And Paul is going to discuss with them several matters here, particularly them judging him and how he feels like that he cannot be judged. And then we're going to get a picture of what uh, being an apostle really is. And it's not, it's not, um, it's not positive. It's, it's, it's pretty rough treatment. And then Paul's going to discuss his uh, attempts to come to them because they're, they're going to need to get together. And that's what this chapter is about. Let us look if we could. As for us apostles... Now, the word apostle is used in two ways in the Bible. It's somewhat confusing. There are the capital A apostles that we call the twelve that were with Jesus, that knew him in his earthly life. Paul is a member of this group, but of course he did not know the Lord in his earthly life. But we would call these capital A apostles. They come to a church, they speak in God's name, they have authority. But there developed another group that's called apostles, but I would call it little a apostles. It included people like Barnabas and Silas and Junius and uh, uh, maybe even Apollos here. And these are ongoing leader types. And I think he's referring to this wider group because he's going to refer to himself and Apollos later on. For us apostles, men ought to think of us as ministers. Now, you may have a footnote in your Bible. This is not the word for minister used back in chapter 3, which is the root word of the form for deacon. This is another word, and it's used um, historically of someone who rowed, rowed a boat on the lowest deck, which would be the hottest and the most miserable. And we've got to be careful, though, of etymological studies that take words back to their oldest usage because we don't know what words originally meant when we use them. We just know what they mean for us. And so I would really say this is just a synonym for minister or servant. If there is any distinction, it means we are the lowest kind of servant. Uh, Maybe that connotation is here. Think of us as uh, ministers, as servants of Christ. And then he adds his thought, and trustees to handle God's uncovered secrets. The word trustee here is the word for steward. It was usually a slave that was given responsibility for some task. The master usually allowed them to do it, but came back and checked up on them at some future point to see how they had been responsible and faithful and diligent and successful in managing uh, the task and the responsibilities they had. And so I think Paul says something to us here. If you're a Christian, you are a steward of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I do believe that we will give an account one day unto God, not for sins, for I believe that Jesus Christ's blood cleanses from all sins. But I do believe that Christians will stand before Christ as stewards of the good news, stewards of the message that's the only hope for the world. Now, these uncovered secrets, um, there are many places in Paul's writing we could go to this idea of mysteries. But it seems to me to sum them up that probably Ephesians chapter 3 is probably the heart of this. It is the secret of the good news, the secret of the gospel, that the one God has now united Jew and Gentile into one brand new family in Christ, the church. And that's this uncovered secret that angels long to look and never realize that men had had no imagination what God was going to do. He was going to combine all men through Christ into one new family that he would call to himself to be his. And I think that's the essence of this. You might want to see Ephesians 3, 4 through 11, and I've given you many other references in your outline. Verse 2 is almost a parenthesis. It's saying 
Now, the first requirement of a trustee is that they prove faithful. Now, he's talking about himself. And he's talking about Apollos, but he's going to talk about every Christian, that every one of us are responsible to give an account of the hope that is in us to anyone who asks. And so he's using himself, but he's speaking to everyone. Verse 3. As for myself, it is a very little concern to me to be examined by you or any human court. Now, I've got to stop there for a minute. Because that does not make sense with the rest of Paul's life. Paul was extremely sensitive to what other people thought, particularly unbelievers. He would severely limit his life. I think if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, latter part of 10, Romans 14, all describe that Paul was concerned with what other people thought about him. He would really limit many of the activities he probably thought was not of importance, but limit himself because of his testimony. This is not saying we don't limit our freedom for our testimony. We certainly do. But Paul was not willing for his ministry to be totally changed by the the proudful, arrogant critique of these uh, factions and their leaders. What he's saying is basically here that uh, he felt like that as God's minister that there was no human being that could judge him and certainly no prideful church. That he knew God would judge him on that day, but until then he did not even examine himself. Now the word any human court... This is literally human day, and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Many of us believe that it's going back to chapter 3, verse 13, where it talks about the day of the Lord, a metaphor for judgment. And here the word day means a, a human court, a, 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 a judgmental tribunal with human motives and human standards is, is what it must mean, though it's a rather unusual phrase. And then he says, I do not even examine myself. Now, the problem with self-examination, and I'm against navel-gazing. I think uh, we spend too much time on that. We don't need to do deep self-examination. Uh, I think if we realize we've sinned against God, we ought to turn it over to Him. But we don't need to, to do a lot of uh, analyzing, because for this reason. Number one, we're, easy, we're usually too easy on ourselves, or we're too hard on ourselves. Or we use standards of comparing ourselves to other human beings. In other words, we don't, we don't judge appropriately or accurately. The only person who can really judge is the Lord. And he's going to describe why the Lord uh, can judge us here. Verse 4. For although my conscience does not uh, accuse me, yet I am not entirely vindicated. Now, what does that mean? Well, he's saying, you know, uh, mentally... I can't think of anything that I'm doing out of the will of God. I, I, I don't perceive any great sin in my life, Paul would say. But even though I don't perceive it, that doesn't mean that I'm fully justified. Now, this is justified not in its technical legal sense, used in the sense of being justified by the death of Christ and his finished work. But this means that I'm not acquitted just because I don't know that I'm doing wrong. Paul's saying God's the only one that can really look at our lives. I mean, he knows the motives, he knows the circumstance, he knows all that's involved. I can't even trust my own conscience when it comes to this. And I, I think that's a, a good word. You might want to see 1 John 3, 19 through 22, where John talks about the conscience. And I think, I think we need to discuss that because sometimes I think in our culture, we think our conscience is synonymous with the Holy Spirit. And of course it is not. Our conscience can be influenced by evil and by culture, and therefore it is not synonymous. So Paul says, I don't know of anything that I could be judged by God, but that doesn't mean that I won't be. And then he continues, it is the Lord himself who must examine me. And I think this is another reference of many that Christians are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We, we noted that this is a strong inference in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. The context demands that it's a Christian. Now, I'm not sure exactly what we're going to do as Christians stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I do believe our sin is forgiven and erased and, and, and gone out of the memory of God. But my friends, we are stewards. And we may well give an account of every word and deed that was not focused toward that stewardship. And uh, that, I think, Judgment Day is going to be a great hallelujah day for us and a tremendously sad day for us. Yes, it's true, God will wipe away all of our tears, but boy, he may really need to on that day. Because when we see what our lives have done to others, 
when we see the others who are lost to eternity because of our inability or unwillingness to follow the will of God for our lives, when we see what our idle words did to others, I think it's going to be a great day of crying and shame for those of us who are the children of God. Now, it continues when it says, verse 5, So you must stop. Now, this is a very special construction in Greek. This is a present imperative with the May article, which means stop an act already in process. They were judging Paul. This church had the audacity to be judging their founder in the faith. They were judging him. And so he says, you must stop forming any premature judgments. And this is the idea of a preliminary examination before a legal trial. But wait until the Lord shall come again. And I think this is a wonderful, I think the second coming is not even an, uh, a real option for people who believe the Bible. There is more references to the second coming of Christ than almost any other major doctrine. But the only question is not if, but when. Now, there is some question about the how, but there is no uncertainty as to the event. Amen? We may disagree on exactly when and why and all the things, that, but friends, Jesus is coming again. And when you see him in Revelation, he's not riding on the colt of the donkey anymore. He is the King of kings, Lord of lords, judge of the universe, the two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. And he will, he will um, set up great white throne judgment at that point. Now, uh, for he will bring to light the, the secrets hidden in the dark. Now, some say this hidden secrets in the dark is a way of talking about Christian sins, but I think not. You can't interpret one passage to deny another passage. The Bible says that our sins are really forgiven in Christ. When God forgives, he forgets. They're gone. So what does it mean, uh, the secrets hidden in the dark? Well, I think it means the things of men's hearts and minds, not so necessarily evil, but the unknown things, the secret things, the covered things. Maybe the next reference, and will make known the motives of men's hearts. Uh, not only will the secret things that we thought no one would know, if they relate to our stewardship of the gospel, they will be revealed. Our motives will be revealed. Why we did this or didn't do this are going to be examined by the Lord. The verses are numerous. I've put many of them in your, in your, in your notes about the idea that God looks at the heart. He doesn't look at the outward things. He goes to the motive. Many religious things that we do, we do for the wrong reasons. And we may have to give an account for them. It continues, and the proper praise will be rewarded to each of us. And I do believe that there are rewards. I'm not exactly sure how this reward system works. But I think if you know your Bibles, Old Testament and New, a recurrent theme over and over is he will give unto each according to his works. There is going to be a day where we are, and it, I, it's hard to believe, rewarded for following and serving the Lord. The, the servant who's a steward will receive pay from a job well done. Now, beginning in verse 6, uh, it seems like he's going to use himself and Apollos as examples. He wants to speak to them, but he's, he's going to use Apollos and himself as a way of kind of getting to them, illustrating plainly what he wants to say. When we get to verse 8, I want to tell you this is some of the most uh, hard-hitting, ironic sarcasm I have ever read in the Bible. This is, I have never seen a more devastating blast from the pen of the Apostle Paul, and he levels with this church when we get to verse 8 through 13. So he starts out in 6. Now, brothers, for your sakes I have applied all this to Apollos and myself, that from us as... Now, this word is terribly difficult to translate. Uh, there are many translations to it. Some, it's a word that can mean transform. It can mean disguise. In this context, it has to mean something like... Um, I'm going to use us as examples. I'm going to illustrate this truth from our lives. It's got to mean something like that. That you might learn the lesson. And here's a little quote. Notice in your Bibles. Look at your footnotes if you have one. Never go beyond what is written. A really good commentator named Mool says this is one of the most difficult phrases in the epistle and is beyond our recovery. Woo, that's a pretty strong statement. I think there's some possibilities here. I'll give you the possibilities, though I don't know which one is right. First of all, this never go beyond what is written. The word written is in perfect tense. It's the normal form used to describe Old Testament scripture. It stands written. 
It has been written. Now, I think because it's in that technical kind of form that every Jew and every Christian going through catechism would know this needs to refer to the Old Testament some way. It's got the definite article before the quote, which means it's a well-known phrase. Now, where is it well-known? Is it a well-known phrase of one of the false teachers or their groups at Corinth? Is it a well-known phrase of Paul's preaching, Apollos' preaching, someone else's preaching? I don't really know. But I do think it probably means this. When you, when you look at it together, it seems to mean don't go beyond what is written in Scripture. And that ministers should not go beyond what is written. I hope if I've done anything with my time here with you, it's this. I don't care who it is. We must hold every speaker for God to the Bible. I don't care how true the message is. If it's not locked in to the scriptures and the original intent of the author and the context and the history, it's supposition. The only thing inspired is the Bible, not my thoughts about the Bible. So what Paul is saying is, don't go beyond the book. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Do the book. It's good advice for all of us. So that you might stop boasting in favor of one teacher against another. Here's that allusion to the factions in verses chapters 1 and 3. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Peter. I'm of Christ. The church was divided over favorite teachers. There's always a danger that we promote some commentator some preacher and say he's number one. They've just talked about that back in chapter 3. All Christian teachers belong to you. All Christian preachers belong to you. The world belongs to you. Life and death belong to you. Eternity belongs to you. Don't pick one preacher. You say, well, this one's the best because they agree with me. Oh, really? My students say, well, I'm going to buy, what commentary could I buy that agrees with me? Well, you don't want to buy the one that agrees with you, dummy. You want to buy the ones that don't agree with you and find out why they don't agree with you. Friends, teachers are meant to pull us and stretch us and force us, and we ought to take them as gifts from God. But never so-and-so's number one, so-and-so's number one. I like this one. I like that one. That is always, always out of the will of God. Apparently, there were these groups that had their own favorite teachers. Verse 7. Now, beginning in verse 7, whew, it starts this, um, this uh, ironic diatribe. Oh, my, it's tough. For who made you superior? Now, I want you to notice that the word you, now, please note this. The word you in verse 7 is singular. It's used twice in the singular. Three times, four times, all in the singular. Now, what does this mean? He's talking about a, this, this supposed teacher of one of these groups. And now he says to this teacher, this one who claims to be so, so uh, educated, one who claims to be so knowledgeable, one who claims to be so superior, even to Paul, for who made you, you friend, you individual, superior? And what do you have that you did not get from someone? And if you got it, first class conditional, you did get it, from someone, why do you boast as though you had not? Now, this is all singular. He's talking to an individual. This verse is one of the most important verses to Augustine. He really built much of the five points of Calvinism around this verse. But even when John Calvin came to this verse, he realized you could not teach all those doctrines from this. This is a general kind of reference. It's just saying everything you got, humanly speaking, about the faith, about your understanding of the Bible... You got it from somebody. Somebody gave that to you. Your knowledge was given to you. You didn't just come up with it. And I think all of us need to realize that. So he's, he's dealing with the individual here, and he's just kind of saying you're, you're, you're puffed up. You think you're something when you're really not. But now, watch this. Verse 8. Look at your Bibles. This is the problem in modern English where we cannot tell when the second person is plural. Now, if you had King James, it ought to have ye. But if you have anything else, it's going to have you. But the verse 8 is you, plural. So we're not talking about the leader of one of these factions. He's, now he's talking to the whole Corinthian church. My soul is he about to level this group. 
Oh my, listen to what he says to these group of Christians. Are you, plural, satisfied already? It's a strong word used for eating so much you're just gorged. Now, it is used metaphorically for spiritual things. Are you spiritually satiated already? Have you already grown rich? Have you ascended your thrones without us to join you? Yes, I could wish that you had ascended your thrones, that we too might join you on them. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on exhibition. Now, stop right there and say, he said to these, this whole church, have you arrived spiritually without me? Have you become the source of all knowledge and when you die, wisdom will die with you? <laughs> have you already reigning with Christ? I'm not even there, Paul says. Can you imagine this church? And then he says, I'm going to tell you now what real spiritual ministry is. Now, folks, these next few verses, I don't think any, much of, many of us would volunteer to be apostles when you read this. It's this false Madison Avenue kind of way of saying, yeah, if, you're, if you really love the Lord, you're going to be healthy and wealthy. Read what God did to his own apostles. Does anybody have more faith than Paul? Is anyone more called than Peter? Here's what these men who were the cream of leadership, this is what they experienced. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on exhibition at the disgraced end of the procession. I personally think this is an allusion to the Roman triumphal entry. Back when the Roman generals would conquer some land, they would come back into Rome. They would not allow the military in Rome. The soldiers had to bivouac outside the city. But the general himself would come in in a tremendous parade, white chargers, uh, all the pomp and glory of Rome. And at the last would be the captured prisoners who were going to die in the arena with the gladiators or the animals. Paul says, I'm like a captured uh, prisoner at the end of, the, of, of what looks like the world's success. Mercy me. As they do with men who are doomed to die. The Tertullian translates this, beast fighters. Some think there's an allusion here to when Paul says, uh, I was on the point of death at Ephesus, that he's alluding to this. I'm not sure. For we have become a, now mine has spectacle, but the word here in English and in, in Greek too is theater. We've been put on display to the universe, to angels as well as men. This may be surprising to you, but the angels don't know what God's going to do. They're shocked at what God's doing with men. They were shocked with the crucifixion. And now they're shocked at what God does with his best leaders. What does he do? They die. They die. If you want a parallel to this, and I think you ought to write it in your Bible because I didn't find it in my parallel edition, but it is there. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7... And Ephesians 3.10 is where it talks about that Christians are on display for the angelic world. The angels are learning about God from how God treats his people. Uh, in Ephesians, positively. In 1 Corinthians 4, negatively. But still there. For Christ's sake, we are held as fools. Now, that's the exact same word that was used earlier for the, for the wisdom of the world, Right? We're, we're seen as fools, Paul says, while, while you, through union with Christ, are men of wisdom. You catch that punch in the stomach? I'm an apostle, and I'm a fool, and you're my converts and my students, and you are so wise, he says to them. <laughs> Mercy. Didn't Jesus say, can a student be above his master? Of course not. It's, it's just sarcastic irony. Listen to this. We are weak. You are strong. You are held in honor. We in dishonor. To this very hour, right up to the present, we apostles, we church leaders, have gone hungry and thirsty and poorly clad. My word. I hope you'll look right in the margin of your Bible. 2 Corinthians 11, 24 through 30. 2 Corinthians 11, 24 through 30, where Paul describes his own life. Beaten, stoned, shipwrecked, 
hungry, thirsty, afraid from countries, everywhere he went, people were after him. Jews were after him. The native people were after him. My goodness. We have been roughly knocked around. This was used of beating a slave. We have had, we have no home. We have worked hard with our own hands for a living. Now the Greeks thought that anybody who did manual labor was just a, a peasant nobody. Nobody worked with their hands in the Greek society. It was their intellects. Well, Paul's society was Jewish. And Jewish society, even the rabbis had to have a job because you couldn't take money for teaching. And so Paul says, I've, wor I've worked my fingers to the bone for you. And now you're sitting in luxury and I'm working myself night and day to preach to you. It's unbelievable. When abused by people, we bless them. When persecuted, we patiently bear it. When we are slandered by them, we try to reconcile them. Sounds like a Sermon on the Mount, doesn't it? What Jesus said, do. To this very hour, we have been made... Look at these two words in your Bible. Strong words. Oh, my. In the last of verse 13, this is my Williams translation. We've been made the filth of the world, the scum of the universe. Now, these, both these words come from a kitchen. Uh, what would be a good example? Um, you ever cook something in a pot and you got to soak it five days to get what's left out? <laughs> My wife made some candy one time. <laughs> Glad you're not here. Uh, we soaked it for a week and couldn't get it out of the pan. I thought about selling it for a construction thing, but... Uh, <laughs> That's the kind. It's that stuff you've got to scrape off of the pan. You get, you get a knife and you scrape that junk off. Who wants that junk that's left over? Who wants that stuff that just comes out in the wash? Paul says, we're like the scourings of the universe. Oh my, what a way to look at the apostles. People think that we're nothing but scum to be thrown out with the garbage. My soul, Paul. In verse 14, I think Paul realizes he just has hit them too hard. He has stepped on their face. And so in verse 14, he comes back and says, I didn't write this to make you blush with shame. <laughs> no, really? <laughs> Looks like you did, Paul. It's just tough words. I didn't write this to make you blush with shame, but to give you counsel as my dear children. He's kind of softening the blow a little bit here. This is what he says. For although you may have 10,000 teachers... Now, they didn't have 10,000 teachers. This is the Greek word used for uh, someone who takes the children to school, who fixes their lunch, who waits for them, who brings them home, who tutors them. It's that kind of slave. Paul says, you may have 10,000 teachers, but you only have one father. And then he says, I am your father. Meaning, I am your father in the faith. I'm the one that brought the gospel here. I told you about Christ. I'm the one that brought all this blessing to you. I'm your father and look at the way you're treating me. For it was I myself who became your father through your union with Christ Jesus, which resulted from my telling you the good news. So I beg you, make it your habit to follow my example. It's a present imperative. Follow my example. Paul says, I'm, I'm considered to be the scum of the earth for Christ and for you. Now, follow me. Uh, I think it's true. Uh, we are called to take up the cross and follow him. And so if you think Christianity has brought you so many benefits and you're getting so much accolade from it, you're probably not doing Christianity. Christianity will always be rejected and despised in a fallen world. And the very fact that Christianity is respected in our culture tells us that we compromise with our culture. Now, this is why I've sent Timothy. Timothy was his uh, convert on the second missionary journey. He, Paul asked him to help him. He was his co-worker, his lieutenant, his representative. He's saying, I've sent Timothy to you, meaning I've sent somebody who, who has my authority. He is a dear child of mine and trustworthy in the Lord's work. He will call to your minds my methods and the work of Christ Jesus. He's going to tell you what I have told him. Just as I teach them everywhere in every church. Paul was saying, Corinth. Are you so special? Do you think you're so different and you're so wonderful and you're so unusual that you think there ought to be a separate standard for you, Corinth, and another standard for all the other churches of Christ? No, no, Corinth. 
there's one standard where all of Jesus' churches conform to. I preach one way, and you've got to conform to that. I'm the apostle, not you. I'm the standard, not you. You must conform, Corinth, not me. And so he tells them that. And then he's going to begin, in verse 18, some travel plans. It may seem innocent to you, but I want to tell you, if you, if, if you read on through 2 Corinthians, these false teachers use Paul's travels plans to accuse him of being untrustworthy. He wanted to come to them this way, but it didn't work out. And they said, see, he's so fickle. He said he'd come, and then he didn't come. You can't trust Paul's gospel. Oh, my. What Paul's saying is, but some of you have become conceited over the thought that I'm not coming to you. Some of these folks took opportunity. They said, yeah, Paul's real impressive in person, I mean, in his letters. But in person, he's just really meek and mild. Oh, he can't even preach good. Read um, 2 Timothy 10, verse 1 and verse 10, and you'll see what they were saying about him. They were saying, oh, he's not coming because he's afraid of us. He just can't back up his theology, so he's afraid to come. Send this young kid over here to do his work. You can just hear what they did to poor Timothy. They just, they really, really um, uh, spiritually beat up this young man. Paul says, you're, uh, you're kind of conceited the fact I'm not coming to you, but I am coming. And I'm coming soon, if the Lord wills. Now, folks, to Paul, this wasn't a cliche. Paul wanted to do several things, and the Holy Spirit stopped him. He wanted to go uh, one time into a different region, and the Holy Spirit said, no, go this way. Paul really meant it when he said, if the Lord willing. And if the creeks rose, Paul went anyway. <laughs> and then I will find out, not only those whose conceited fellows say, but what they can do. Paul says this. These are... Uh, superior teachers of yours, uh, these superior factions that think they're so wonderful. I'm coming, and I'm going to see if their deeds match their words.